not always agreeing. But for the rest of us who are not so good at soil sciences, not a problem. What you want to do is you still want to capture all the important information regarding soils, right? What's the color? What's the consistency? What's the texture? What's the structure? What are, what's the water content? And at least with these descriptions, these characteristics, it's a little, it, a little easier and a little more standardized in the way to approach it. So, soil colors. So this color sheet right here is called the Munsell uh, Soil Color Book. And it, this is in fact a book. That one sheet you see right there is one of like 20 pages in that book. And it's, a, it's dozens and dozens of varieties of colors and different hues, values, and chromas. You don't necessarily always have to use that description, but when you're looking at soils, be explicit. Is it a reddish soil? Is it white? Is it gray? All of those colors are, rep are representations of the different uh, chemical compositions of the soil. So reddish soils tend to be high in iron. White soils tend to be highly calcified or ha have a higher calcium concentration. Things like that. I'm not gonna explain this too much. I'm hoping everybody understands what this, are, this is, but this is helping you identify the texture. Is your soil a clay? Is it a clay loam? Is it a silt loam? And you, what you're doing is you're identifying by feel what that, what that soil is. So if it's overly gritty, like sand, sand has the highest grain, largest grain size, or is it clay, which is your moderate gra grain size, or silt, which is super fine. Structure, again, not gonna go into too much detail, I've got some reference photos here. Just, just, just give basic descriptions of, of the soil where you can. At least here in many cases, you're, at least the areas that we're gonna be in a crop, I, I believe are gonna be more heavier clays, probably loamy clays, things like that. So it'll be a little easier to describe the texture because most of it's gonna be smooth. And geology, geomorphology, also really important. Luckily, this is standardized. Geologists and geomorphologists agree on a lot of the naming and the classifications of these systems. So very easy to find a reference scheme that you can utilize and that is universal across the board. But things that, that these things, these, these features are indicative of how the soil formed, under what conditions did the soil form, what's the microclimate. So certain, uh, certain geo geomorphological features and certain geological lands landscapes will dictate where you can find certain species, where you can find certain, uh, certain types of trees or certain types of shrubs, so forth. Hopefully everybody can identify their rocks, at least the basic, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary. Yeah, okay. And final information that you might want to add into your field notebook. Really anything of interest that you're, you notice at the site. Are you in an area that's where the, that's a natural, is it a national park? Is there a high traffic of people through there? If not, that, that's worth noting. Or are you in, an, in a, a little habitat pocket, a little patch, that happens to be adjacent to a really busy highway and there's a village over here and there's illegal logging going on over here. Note all of that because that is something that, especially if you try to come back to one of these sites 10 years from now, what's, you know, what have these factors done to impact the species that you found? Maybe that species is no longer here and how's it maybe changed the composition, the species composition and the species structure within that site? Um, other things to consider, uh, recent disturbances, any fires, flooding, uh, is there a volcanic eruption, things like that. Also, draw pictures, illustrations, something that maybe sometimes you can't describe what you've seen. I can't describe what this, this soil strata looks like, but I can draw it. Maybe you wanna draw, draw, you know, draw where your base camp is and draw a map of all of the sites that you went to so you can get a visual representation of the, re of the spatial relationship of all of those locations. Whatever is gonna help you remember that site and remember that, that survey. Anything that will jog your mind on that one. And finally, you've seen this before, everybody talks about photographs, so I won't go into too much detail on that because I think Rafe and Dave did an awesome job. So I'm just gonna show you some pretty pictures because that's fun. Um, and actually this picture right here is from Senegal. 
and all of these are. So that first picture and these two on the left were, were what we found during the day, during daytime surveys looking for potential habitat for Osceolamus tetraspis. And these are African dwarf crocodiles over in Senegal. And so we noticed this, and it's kind of hard, this is actually a really dark pho photo, but what this is right here, that's actually the, ent uh, the entrance to a, a burrow. And this is on the terrestrial side, and an entrance to a burrow on the, uh, in, the, in a, the shallows of a pool. And this, this is actually right in a remnant habitat area. So this was a beautiful like, habitat patch of just like this beautiful lush canopy forest. And it was surrounded completely by ag land. And so it's fascinating, we came back at night, and we came back, this is this exact same spot, and what we could see the biggest difference is, it's hard to tell on here, but there are actually tail drag marks in the substrate and the, on, on the bedding of the, of the pool. This is what our habitat looked like. It was beautiful and very muggy. And those are what the little guys that we found in there. So from that experience, it was, we wanted to make sure that we get photos at all scales not just of the animals. So Rafe and Dave talked about getting all these great shots and having great shots of the specimen, but you don't want just images of the specimen. You want different spatial scales of the habitat that you find them in. The only, the only photo I don't have, because I can't find it and I know I have it somewhere, is backed out even further where you actually see that habitat patch and, you're, and I'm standing in you know, somebody's you know, uh, cassava fields, I think. All right, so putting it all together, talking about my little Osteolamus guys. We were 1.75 kilometers southwest of Point St. George's in the Casamont, Senegal. There's my written locality. And it, I specifically state where we found the hatchlings. They're in, the, they're in covered, covered completely in the water, making sure, and they were always under tight canopy conditions where the, where the brush was over, very closely overhanging the water. Describe the, describe the water itself, describe the depth of the pool, describe how each of the, the specimen were distributed amongst the pool, describe the soils of the pool itself and the soils around the, uh, of, on the terrestrial areas around the pool. So, and then additional information that I would have, that I added in was that we did identify the site based on that act, the, the, the indications of an active burrow that we found during the daytime. We also saw evidence of adult specimen. We didn't see any of them, but we saw actual evidence based on, based on the, uh, the movements around the burrow. And then also explained that we're directly adjacent to all these, ag almost completely surrounded by agriculture because that highly impacts, well, should I expect to see them here in 10 years? I probably shouldn't be too surprised if I go back to that site and they're not there anymore. Um, yeah. And like Rafe said, I believe in his talk yesterday, that over time you learn how to say all of this in these last two sides in much less verbiage. I didn't take pictures of my field notes because you wouldn't be able to read them, interpret them in any way because my handwriting is atrocious. But I also would have added in a picture of the pool, a picture of the bur uh, drawings of the pool, drawings of the burrows and whatnot. And those are the counterparts of the guys I was working with in Senegal. All right, so just to recap, because I've rambled on for far longer than I intended to. Requirements, you want a daily dedicated notebook, ideally waterproof. And actually, those, everybody going out to the field, we do have a small one to get you started with your notes. So you're gonna get a small right in the rain notebook to carry with you. And so as you're following everybody around and not just, the herpers aren't just gonna be doing herp stuff, the birders aren't just gonna be doing bird stuff. You're gonna be, have the chance to kinda check out what other fields do, what other taxons do to, to take information. You're gonna start practicing taking your daily notes. You're gonna start practicing describing all of these conditions that affect your species of interest and their species that you've captured in your inventories. Remember, your, personal field, your, your field notebook is your personal detailed account of anything and everything about your field experiences and observations. It's, in a sense, it's a journal, it's a field journal. Anything that might be worth remembering doesn't have to be just about the species that you're collecting. It can be about the site that you visited, what's the background of it, who are the people that you collaborated with. Would you collaborate with them again? 
What hotel did you stay at? Where did you get supplies at? Think about not just this trip, not just this expedition. What about subsequent ex expeditions? How are you going to make that happen? So think about the whole broader, that whole big picture as you're working on these. Again, major components. You've been through all of these. You've heard me chatter about them quite enough. One last note on everything. Now that you've got all your spatial, con you've got your spatial context, you've got your temporal context, you've georeferenced your locality GPS data using your written, uh, written locality data, so you know that you are actually here, even though your GPS said you're here, you were right here. Now you can start looking at regional and global or larger landscape analyses. That's when you can go, that's after you've gone home, you've looked through all your notebooks again, and you start seeing maybe some, some patterns amongst the different species that you inventoried. That's when you're going to apply your remotely sensed data. Depending on your, your spatial scale, you can get you know, high resolution DEMs through Aster, which is it's a global scale, but it's, but it's great if you're trying to look at you know, different, what, how different elevational gradients affect, impact your species, or even more moderate resolution for global analyses like MODIS and Landsat. And I cheated and I used uh, the easy version of Landsat, which is Google Earth. Um, I attempted to download some Aster data here and it took a little while. So instead of using so Google Earth, and after georeferencing my, using my photos, using my written and GPS locality data, <laughs> This is where we are located in just south, uh, south by southwest of Point St. George. And it's, it's, it's moderately clear. So where you see all these little dark fingerlings coming out, those are those nice canopy forested areas. And in one little pocket right here, that's where we found our osteolamus. And to give you a better idea of where it sits on the spatial landscape, uh, landscape we're looking at right there. So that's an easy, quick and dirty, easy way to apply your, apply your, uh, your, your data at a larger, at, at that more global scale. But there are so many ways you can apply that. There are so many, so many applications looking, whether it's niche modeling, whether you're looking at impacts of land use change over time at a national or regional level, so on. I'm not going to get into much of that because that is other courses and not today. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kate, for mm -hmm. the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, it so happens that sometimes when you're in a place like this working, mm -hmm. some people will bring in specimens, and certainly they're children, and they can't tell you anything about the specimen. Mm -hmm. How do you best record that and uh, for the habitat? You just let it go and you record the specimen was brought or you attach some kind of quality information? If you, uh, with a specimen like that, you do the best you can. Sometimes all you can say is, you know, you brought us a bird that was found on the University of Buya campus and if you give us an idea of at least where it, that specimen was found, then you can actually do a priori investigation of where that area is. You may not be able to have explicit locality information. You're not going to have the explicit information about, you know, time of day, things like that, but you can look up, okay, well, this general area is, you know, an ecotone between savanna and uh, dry tropical rainforest. And you can begin to narrow down some of those qualitative informations. But at the same time, Sometimes you just have to note that it, we don't know, or it was a zoo specimen, or it came from a pet store. Some, but somebody brought it to us, and we now have it in our collection as at least a genetic resource. 